Kelsey, the question we used to ask in college late at night uh, is, you know, what's the mind-body problem? How do you relate what we feel, what we see, what, what, what this quality experience that we have, how does that relate to our physical brain? And there's a, a wide variety of answers that philosophers and scientists and theologians have given us from one extreme is extreme reductionism, so that's just everything can be explained in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, atomic uh, movement of the physical particles to emergence, you need some special characteristic different phases to other people who say you can never explain consciousness by brain alone because consciousness is something special, then theologians might have a soul. So you have this vast spectrum of, of, uh, of smart people giving radically different answers. What's your answer? I'm a reductionist. Okay. I mean, I'm definitely a reductionist, but it doesn't mean that I don't believe that well, there are I'm all these a, incredible... I didn't accuse you of that. No, I, I know, just want I know, to... I, I do feel a little bit okay, defensive right, about that's being a reductionist. Right, be, I'm a reductionist because... You should be proud I, of it. Be I, proud of I it. I am proud of okay, being a reductionist. Good. I want to understand how things work. Okay. And I don't think... You know, I believe that by understanding how things work, we're going to have. It doesn't mean I don't have an appreciation about the wonder for the wonderful things. I understand things. that. I understand that. I understand. Uh, I, you know, I, I often in think. Your reductionism. I often think I'm somebody who, if I went to go look at the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, and I'm incredibly moved by it, I want to understand what the pigments are in the paint that made that, and I really believe that that doesn't detract from the incredible. Um, beauty of the painting and everything that it's expressing. Mm -hmm. And I feel that way about, uh, you know, that consciousness can be really understood in the, in, in the context of the, and the mind can be understood in the, in the context of the physical brain. That I think that what is so um, just remarkable and, and awe-inspiring about the brain is that there's this circuit of neurons. Each neuron has an enormous DNA. That DNA changes with um, over with evolution, um, and that all of that somehow comes together to create uh, human beings, other animals, uh, who all have remarkable behaviors. But I really want to understand, I believe that all of that comes from these fundamental molecular processes of DNA being made into RNA, RNA being made into proteins, neurons connecting with one another at synapses, forming circuits that can encode memories, um, forming cir uh, circuits that really can encode feelings, um, generate thoughts, lead to creations of incredible um, sort of profundity and importance in the now, world. People who claim that that is unlikely to be true talk about just the complexity of memory yeah. and all. But th there is so much potential that neurons have. Let's go through some of the numbers. How, about how many neurons do we have in our brain? A trillion. A trillion. A trillion. It's a huge number. And how many can they connect to? They're about a, a quadrillion uh, connections. So about so a thousand each. Some say up to 10,000 each, 10, or maybe a thousand on, on average. Uh, and so there's a quadrillion number of different connections. Now, even within those connections, there are different levels of molecular strengths and at, at, the, at the level of the individual neuron. So that also can add another level of modulation on it, potentially. Right, right, right. So you have a huge amount of, uh, of substrate with which to work. And so your argument would be is that when you have such a huge amount understood in that way, that that, that together can explain what we think it are these very uh, lofty ideas of what our consciousness is. Uh, yeah, that's what I believe. And not only do we have this enormous number of components, but they're all dynamic. So they're changing right. all the time. Right. Right. So it, it really, the complexity becomes phenomenal. And purely I don't, physical. It's purely physical, purely physical. And, 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 and totally can be totally reduced and, and explained in terms of their uh, uh, um, subatomic or atomic structure, which builds up to what the the the, uh, the uh, mo molecules are and what the cells are. I mean, it's a it's a linear process. We may not understand a lot of it in detail, but you right. can trace the linearity. That's that's what I believe. Now, some would say that uh, purely physical. There's no souls or anything. No ghost in the machine or anything. Purely physical, but that it's fundamentally impossible in principle to be a reductionist because you need, on each level of, of, of operations, you need a, a separate set of, of, of rules and laws. You really, so each, within each level of hierarchy, you can be a reductionist, but you can't be a linear reductionist. There are principles at every level which are fundamentally different. Well, I don't, I don't think that I can understand 
the logic at every level. I think that that's very complex. Maybe it will be understood in time, but I don't is, see that. In principle, right. can you know it? Because some people say, in principle, I can never, I can never break through that barrier. When I'm at the level of brain circuits, I can never explain that in terms of molecular structure. So I believe that you can explain right. it in terms of molecular right. structure, and I think we need tools. I'm, it's, it's one of the beautiful things in biology is that more and more tools are being developed that allow us to probe different aspects of biology. And the more uh, powerful those tools are, the more we learn about things that we had no imagination about. What's uh, some examples of that from your own field where you're able to show in the operation of a single neuron much more sophistication, much more analysis because of the tools that you now have that you didn't have when, when, when I was here uh, right. uh, 40 years ago? Well, there are many examples. I mean, one um, that's really the result of a discovery, less than a tool, is a discovery that there are a very large number of very small RNAs in the cell called microRNAs. They regulate gene expression in incredibly important mm -hmm. ways. They weren't known, they weren't, nobody knew about them until about 20 years ago or so. And it turns out, you know, it, that's something that if nobody even knew, they're very small, they were sort of below the detection of, uh, uh, mm -hmm. the limit of detection mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, and now there's a huge field that's emerged that helps us understand how those small RNAs regulate the expression of, of proteins. And, and where cells. are they? Are they at the synapse? They're at the synapse, they're in the cell body, they're in many parts of the body, they're not just in the brain, but sure. there are a lot that are enriched in the brain. Um, there are other tools that have been developed that allow us, for example, there's a field called optogenetics where you can express a channel in brains that with a light you can activate a whole circuit of neurons. Mm -hmm. And so obviously there, if you put, if you put a light in a brain, uh, usually with a fiber optic cable, and you activate that circuit, you can now really start to ask questions about what are the dopaminergic neurons doing? Mm -hmm. What are the um, adrenergic neurons doing? Uh, and, and start to link some of those circuits to behaviors. That's a tool that I think is, is really transforming a lot of, of neuroscience. And then there are lots of genetic tools, being able to manipulate specific genes in different animals. So those are the, that's kind of the range of... of uh, so if you had to predict, um, with the progress in neuroscience so dramatic, how many years, decades, centuries would it take for the rest of the neuroscientific and the philosophical world to finally agree with you that reductionism is real? How long is it going to take? You know, take? I think one of the problems is that our experience as human beings isn't necessarily consistent with reductionism. It, you know, reductionism, when you're trying to understand something, it feels so... Uh, almost uh, cold and distant, and yet our experience as human beings is a very different experience. So I think it's going to take, uh, you know, if I think about how long it's going to take in terms of tools and discoveries yeah, yeah. and results, I still think as many results as we have, that doesn't, and for me, it doesn't have to capture the experience of, of uh, consciousness, the experience of feeling close to another person, the experience of really, um, you know, reading a beautiful poem and being moved by it. That process, I don't see any need to reduce that. I mean, I think I, I could explain it. I think it's an emergent phenomenon of all of these synapses firing in neurons. But the experience itself has value for me. Uh, and I wouldn't necessarily want to, you know, I lose that, that the whole experience by having to dissect it every time. It's the same thing with, you know, the same thing with a painting that you look at. You can't understand how it was made. Um, but it doesn't take away from the experience of the whole painting and what it's expressing to you. Um, or a movie that you're watching, mm -hmm. it had to be made with film, the film has you know, silver grains or <laughs> however it's working, um, but the movie is telling you something larger, it's putting it all together, it's a more synthetic experience. So I think there are two sides, there's the reductionist, but there's also a synthetic, but I don't think that the, the synthetic takes away from the reductionism.